you know, it, it, we've worked a ton in order to get to where we're at now. Like I said, you know, endless hours, it feels like. However, you know, we're at a point where we're starting to, to, to recognize some of the rewards for that. You know, the, yeah. the cash flow from the properties that I own, the majority of is, you know, is phenomenal. I mean, just the, the, just the money from the laundry room is more than most people probably make in a month, you know, and, and, and so, don't tell me that, man. It hurt my feelings. Yeah. Yep. Why don't you tell me a little bit uh, about yourself, how you got started and, and kind of where you're at now? Yeah. So, uh, so I was, I grew up in North Dakota, yeah, mine in North Dakota, which is, if you see the sign behind me here, land of Dakota, it's uh, been, you know, that's what I grew where I grew up, loved it. Uh, when I got out of high school, it was, you know, I was ready for something different. So I moved to Florida. Uh, when I moved to Florida, I got into the fire service pretty early on. I was 18, 19 years old and went to college, but, you know, like the uh, appeal of doing firefighting and like kind of serving the public and helping people out and all that stuff. So did that. I've uh, been doing that for 22 years. Um, still doing it to this day uh, right now, but maybe exiting, you know, this year. Uh, and then we, what, probably seven years ago, I got into real estate. And what really kind of like got me thinking about real estate was that I was, I found myself as I got married, started having kids, you know, all the normal family stuff that yeah, um, I hear you. You know, I mean, just the, the, you know, I was like in a vice grip and it just kept getting tighter and tighter. And I'm like, Man, you know what? <laughs> the only thing I, I knew to do, right? Like blue collar background was work harder, you know, put your head down, do more hours, be gone longer. And, you know, I was just trading my time for money. And it was, I, I got to a point where there was a year where I worked a thousand hours of overtime on top of my normal shift, which is our normal shift is 24 hours on. And then we have two days off. Wow. And so. Yeah. So there, I mean, the, the place I worked at, it was like, you know, you could, you could really write your own check because as, as much as you were willing to work, they needed the, they needed the people. So I worked and worked and worked and, you know, I got to the end of that year and I thought, you know, I really started kind of like, re, like kind of looking back at it. And that's when I realized like, you know, I was literally physically not at my house with my wife, kids for six months out of 12. And I'm like, this is just not sustainable. You know, it's not sustainable for me mentally physically for my kids, my wife, you know, all the relationship uh, challenges that, that brings. And so I really was like, what, you know, I got to do something different and, and uh, reconnected through, I think it was Facebook with a friend of mine that I went to college with where okay. I kind of went into the fire service and then he went into real estate and he, he was, when I knew him, he was going in to be a, an agent. Uh, but when I reconnected with him, he was this massive investor with a huge following and, wow. and it was really kind of like had the mastermind thing going before it was a thing you know what i mean it was really yep. neat. and so he sent me a um he, he put on like a how to flip a house kind of seminar and he sent it to me as an mp3 via email which kind of shows you how long ago it was but that was my first <laughs> to do it right there wasn't like hgtv or one of these other shows that love to you know they always love to tell you or show you the great things about it and and i really learned i guess the biggest thing i picked up in that series that he gave me was economies of scale and how every house that he flips, he uses the same carpet, the same paint, the same vanities, the same everything. And that's how he's able to do the volume that he does. Yep. Uh, and so I really like kind of put that in the back of my mind, like, like I can align with that. Like I, cause it was the time when I got started, it was like, I'm going to do real estate to have passive income to create, you know, a better situation for my family that I, you know, when I graduated high school, I got a, I always say I got a hug and a handshake for my parents and that was it. I mean, they didn't, you know, yeah. there was no like, there's no like formal, like, Hey, if you go to college, we did tour colleges. It wasn't like, Hey, you know, all these different things that I see a lot of other people do. And it, no, you know, it's not like a, a it's not a, a negative thing towards them, but you know, it really just pushed me to, I want to be better and do better. And yeah. So yeah. That was kind of how I kind of got started down the real estate path. So now were, were you still working while doing real estate or was that a, you just went cold Turkey and jumped right into real estate. You said about seven years ago you started. Yeah. So I so 2015 ish. Yeah. So I've maintained my career even to today, and I'm doing. So what what I, the, the, what was great about it is you know we would work. I'd work a 24 hour shift, and then I'd have two days off. Okay. So I found somebody locally in my market that was flipping houses, and I was like, look, I want to. You know, I, I met with him and kind of figured out what he what his needs were and where I could help him. And so, you know, I did not have a lot of experience, but I had time. And he needed somebody that had time that he could trust to kind of oversee his projects and then help with the, the property management side of his portfolio, his rental portfolio. So that's what I did. I offered him. I'm like, look, I'll, I, I can run contractors. I can, I, I know enough about building instruction to know, 
whether they're doing it right or not, and whether they're staying on time and on budget and all those things. And, uh, well, and Seth, then, where did you develop those skills that you could run contractors and crews, right? Because prior to this engagement that you created and set up with this investor, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you didn't have any prior experience in doing construction. So is there some, did you read books? Did you go to a mastermind? Where did you start getting that knowledge that enabled you and positioned you to say, hey, I'll give you my time and manage the construction sites. You deploy the funds and we'll partner up yep. kind of thing. Uh, so really like my career, you know, like the fire service, I've, you know, we're, we're heavy into building instruction and code enforcement and, and knowing the building codes, knowing the fire codes. Um, and then just in general, like it's a, just a huge part of your job is to understand these buildings uh, as they stand on a regular day. So when they're on fire, we can understand, you know, could this building collapse? Could this building do this? Could this do that? And so we have to understand how they're constructed, what type of construction there is, whether it's legacy construction, which would have been like pre 1990. 19, you know, like where they're using yeah. like traditional lumber, even just the material that they're using nowadays. Um, and then we have to understand the building codes. We have to understand the fire code. So a lot yeah. of that stuff, you know, I, at the time, you know, could I go in and say, you know, and I would say this too, like most firemen, you know, they always have a second job. So whether it's, they have their own like flooring company or drywall or painting, or, you know, they're very heavy in the trades uh, industry. And so just being around that for most of my career, you know, I go to work and I've got three general contractors on my crew, you know, I've got, and so all these conversations over 20 yeah. plus years, it's like, you just know how to, you just know it. And then uh, being an officer in the fire service, I already run, you know, I'm already in control of, of other people have to make split second decisions. So you learn, you're picking, you've picked up management yeah, the, skills and, yeah, and managing that, people yeah, so, and so on. Yep. Personal yeah. skills as well. Right. Yeah. Because so you, then managing you need contractors. Those. Yeah. Was, was, was easy, you know, and yeah. again, I don't necessarily have to know how to do it, but I can tell you whether or not it was right or wrong or whether it was gotcha. the that we, we had set. So that's the, so that's the, the reason why I asked that question is because a lot of people, and I'm look, I myself, I jumped straight into real estate. I didn't segue. I came from pharmaceutical W2 job, you know, making generic drugs to saying in 2018, Hey, I'm going all in on real estate, mm -hmm. but there are people who are, you know, tossing and turning between the decision. Right. And uh, I think you're a great prime example of, Hey, you can do both, right? You can, you can find, if you can manage your time, which you seem to have been doing really well, right? Working that 24 hour shift and then not sitting the next day watching Netflix all day, right? right. Like yep. you, you had a goal, you had a vision and you went to it, right? So how long did you do that? And I, I mean, I know you said you're still working your other job yeah. you're now at the stage of um, looking to potentially go straight into or full time into real estate. So You've done that now. Think about that, folks. Seth has been doing this for seven years, right? Working his current job. I I'm telling you, brother, I don't know how you did it, man. I probably would not have lasted that long. Yeah. But you've gone seven years. Now, through that seven years, gained so many experiences, physical, like, you know, on-site experience. I'm sure mastermind experience, leveling up. So now, as you're faced with this, decision right of uh, looking to transition completely into um real estate so what does your current business look like how do you how many units you own if any are you just primarily doing fix and flips what does it look like so that now you're positioning yourself to move full-time into real estate yeah so for, i did the uh, i kind of like did the whole like working for free for a year that was like, <laughs> I, I say it was a year of, I mean, I, I jokingly say I worked for free, but really what I gained was a ton of experience, um, you know, connections with local vendors and, 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 you know, and material suppliers and all those kinds of things. And then, you know, it also gave me a resume to go to a lender and actually have some experience, right? Because that was the big thing is, is getting your first deal done. And so I skipped multi or I skipped single family and I, and I didn't, I've never flipped a house. I've never owned, a, I've never wholesaled, never owned a single family. Wow. I went straight to multifamily. Um, I knew that that was the vehicle that I wanted to use to achieve the goals I had. And, uh, and so I went, I, the first thing I ever bought was a 50 unit uh, with one other investor. So it was myself and another guy who was completely passive. Um, but I, I found the deal and I thought, man, this is it. I, I really had bought into commercial multifamily and how you can scale. And, um, and so that was the, I bought that. Uh, How'd you find the deal? Through, you know, it was, again, networking. I 
would go to local uh, real estate offices and I would just tell people, look, here's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm looking for commercial multifamily. I prefer to be off market or pocket listing. If you find anything, you know, kind of here's the buying criteria that I'm looking for and let me know. And for a long time, I didn't hear anything. And then I had a lady call me and she's like, Hey, I've got a guy, you know, in this, it was a tertiary market of Columbus uh, and was like, you know, he's looking to sell this thing. You know, it needs a lot of work, but you know, it could be great. Why don't you take a look at it? And so I looked at it and I was, you know, at the, the, I looked at it through the lens that I, that I had back then, which I look back now and I'm like, it should have scared me probably more than it did. But <laughs> I was so excited and just believed in myself enough to know that if I could just get the deal done, I would, you know, I would, you know, I would do anything to make it successful. And, yeah. And, that, and that's a great, you know, you bring up a very good point, right? At that point in time, you were faced with this uncertainty, this unknown, right? But you had enough confidence in yourself, not listening to the noise around you or outside of you, but you had enough confidence in yourself to say, hey, if I can just get this deal done, I know I can make this deal work. Yep. Right. And I think a lot of people get nervous and scared about that. They they'll get to the point of potentially getting a deal and then they won't pull the trigger because they're so afraid of the unknown that's going to happen once they own it. Well, it's the same thing as, hey, if you were so afraid of the unknown trying to get a deal now that you found one. Well, if you just work the same eth with the same ethic. Right. You're going to get to the accomplishment that you want to have. Right. A successful multifamily unit. Right. So. Yeah. So that was your first 50. There's a big value add deal. Like there's a lot of work that was required. Yeah. So I it was um, we bought it for one point seven million. I think I probably put I put in a couple hundred thousand, but that's because I was there doing a lot of the work, like a lot of the sweat equity. Again, you know, with my background, I knew how to, you know, I installed, I think, 130 windows in that property. Wow. You know, so I, a lot of the work I did either by my, what I started off doing it by myself. And then I realized quickly uh, that, you know, people were leaving faster than I could fix a unit up because, you know, just the, the type of tenant that was there, it was the traditional value add, you know, C-class, you know, it had been kind of loosely ran, which is where yeah. I saw the upside. What I didn't realize was that, you know, there was, there was, it was about 95% occupied when we bought it. But then within the first few weeks of owning it, we had like 12 more people move out because they wow. realized that the gig was up, right? That the, oh, these people actually are going to manage it. There's people on site, like, and the, the, the same old, you know, tricks that they'd been playing for months or years as they lived there were, was over. And so we had a lot of people leave in the middle of the night, which, you know, that got pretty scary, you know, in the beginning, but I knew as long as I stayed at least 75, 70% occupied, it would cash flow enough to, to uh, pay the bills. And, um, you know, so like I said, I was, had I not been there, you know, been a, like a, a very hands-on owner operator at that time, you know, it, it could have went sideways, but I was yeah. there, you know, again, I was, I was betting on myself. I would knew I was willing to do whatever it took to make it successful because I knew that if I could get it to be successful and make it to the refinance, it would set me off for, to, you know that that's yeah. the ship, right? You're now you're 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 flying. So that was it. So so how did you um, did you raise the one point seven through private investors? Did you go get hard money and then you raise the rehab portion? How did you structure the capital raise on that? So we with the purchase price was one point seven. We had to put twenty five percent down between me and the one other investor. We were able to come up with that amount. Um, and, and when you say come up, is that your personal funds or did yeah, you? So I put get... in, I put in, I put in some personal money. He can, he put in. Um, it's kind of interesting. So we were originally told that we would get twenty. We were only had to put down twenty percent. So we each were going to put in ten, right? And then at the like the week of closing, they're like, "Nah, it's got to be twenty five percent." So I ended up going to a private investor that was like wow. a hard money lender who normally does first position mortgages only, who does um, fix and flips, and he was recommended to me from a friend of mine. Uh, and I called him and I'm like, look, here's the situation. Like, can you guys help me? And they, they threw in the last like $75,000 um, at a pretty steep interest rate, but I didn't care. I was like, the deal's got to get done. And I know yeah. that if I do it right, I execute properly. They're going to get paid back. Um, so that got the deal done. And then when I, this whole exodus happened, I was like, what do, you know, what do I do? And I had, I think we had 50,000 in the bank to do these renovations uh, and I called a friend of mine who I had met through networking again. He was a firefighter in Strongsville in, up towards Cleveland. And he left the fire service and was, I think at the time he had 600 some units. Now he's got like 900. Um, wow. But I talked with him and he was like, you don't have enough money. Like you've got to go and raise some money immediately for this CapEx because I didn't, back then I didn't know about bridge loans. 
So I financed it traditionally. All I had, the, you know, they did the loan, but they wouldn't give me any money for construction. Yep. And, you know, he's like, you're never going to get this thing turned around without having more money to, to put into the deal. So again, I'll do whatever I got to do. And, and that was it. I tracked down through networking, through friends, family. You know, I came up with about another $200,000. Uh, we maxed out credit cards. I mean, we did, I'll, you know, like whatever I got to do to get this done is what I, what I did. You put it on the line. Yeah. Right. You, be, you believed in that project. See, this is the point that a lot of people fail at. If you believe 100%, you've got to put it on the line. Like, you, there's no sugarcoating it. If it was easy, everybody would do it. You know what I mean? So that's a great point that you bring up. So, okay, you got first position debt at, one, you know, uh, 80% of the 1.7. Yep. Then they went from 20% down to 5 Twenty-five percent. So you need an additional five percent. So you raised yep. sec additional money. Yep. So would it be fair to say they were in second position at they a were, higher rate? Yep. Okay. Yeah, they're officially second position. Yeah. Now you raised more money after that for the capex. How did you structure that? Did you take a? Did you raise enough capital in there to take the second position lien out and then put the capex in second position, or did they go in third position? No, they just did strictly uh, like below promissory. Level promissory notes to me based on my credibility and knowing me. And they were just like, this guy will die on this hill and give up his house and, you know, whatever, before we, he loses a dime for us. So they, they just, you know, we did a simple uh, promissory note. They gave me the money and that was it. Yeah. Th that is a great point. And the reason why I asked you those questions is because people are going to wonder like, well, how did he raise all this money? How did he, how did Seth structure all of this? Right. So ladies and gentlemen, not every single capital raise that you do, has to be leaned up against the, the subject property, right? That CapEx that Seth is raising is literally based off a relationship, trusted relationship. They trusted Seth knowing the kind of man that he is, the person that he is, that he was going to perform on what he was saying. And I'm assuming you are performing, right? Because we're yeah. sitting in 2022 yeah. and you bought that deal yeah, in 2015. We're a lot bigger now too. So yeah, so the... Uh... So the, so it went, I mean, it, again, lots of struggles, lots of lessons learned, you know, I mean, I don't want to brush over and say that it was easy, but, you know, we made it to, we made it through the, um, the stabilization of it. Uh, and so on month 14, we, we renovated 42 of the units in a, in a year. And then at month 14, we refinanced it and we pulled out a million dollars of value we created. So we paid everybody back. Wow. Right, plus their interest. And then we had money left over and we're like, let's go buy another one. So, so here, I want to ask a question. Okay. So you, it took you from day one of acquisition to 14 months to get to the refi point, right? Yep. During that time span, how much time did you spend rehabbing? And at what month did you, was it at month five, six, did you realize like, you know, like, I need to remove myself as the carpenter or the, the, the contractor mm -hmm. and bringing a team. Uh, so it's probably early on. We were doing like, I was always there. So I was on site every day when I wasn't at the fire station, I was on site every day for hours. You know what I mean? Like I lived down there. Okay. But I, and I knew that it had to go right. Um, but I realized probably, probably a month into it that I'm like, this is, this is just not gonna, like, I've got to have, cause there was too many things, too many things going on that I had to, like, for instance, we were, we knew that part of the plan was to gut the whole laundry room and the office that they had there and turn it into like a larger laundry room that was adequate and whatnot. So I spent a lot of time personally renovating that while these units were continuing to come open. So I started reaching out through different, um, you know, different marketing avenues uh, to try to find contractors. But then I, you know, I was interviewing them uh, and, and found about five that I felt were, were trustworthy and could do good work. And then I just would go over, like we would meet in the morning and I'd say, look, these are the units we're in. And I would order all the material. I pick up the material or have it delivered and they would just be there working. They would be there working every day. Uh, so you GC the projects, safe yeah. to say? Okay. Yep. And yeah. how did you find those contractors? Was it Craigslist, Facebook? Um, you know, how did you go about finding those contractors? And how did all, you evaluate them? All of the above. Yeah. Craigslist was hit and miss. Uh, Facebook was pretty good. You know, I went through a lot of them too, right? Because I was there and I could, and I would, I knew the quality of work and I'm like, this isn't it. You know, you, you know like I said, I, I knew that I could tell quickly whether or not they were actually going to fit or not. And then I think part of it was I just sold them on the vision, you know, like I'm like, look, yeah. I'm, 
we're going to buy more down here. If you guys do good work, you're going to be around. We took good care of them. We paid them well. They got paid on time, which was, you know, they said it was very, very important. Uh, important. And then too, like they, I think that a lot of them, uh, I've got two of them that still work for me pretty much full time right now down wow. in that area. But they, they respected the fact that they're like, man, no other owner that we've ever seen is like down here with us doing the work or in the trenches with us, you know, and yeah. I, just, I was there every day. So, you know, I realized uh, we got the laundry room kind of done and it was cash flowing and doing well. And then I was kind of overseeing them and then picking up the material. And somewhere in there, I realized that like, this is not a scalable model, right? If I come down and I hang drywall all day, all I've done is hung drywall. Yep. I need to be like talking to other investors and like looking for the other deals or talking to brokers and whatnot. And, and at that level where I was at, I couldn't just focus on that. Cause like I said, I couldn't take my eye off the ball. I yeah. had one of the guys I kind of moved into like that kind of, um, you know, he was kind of like the GC where he was kind of overseeing. I talked to him directly. And so I wasn't, I, I couldn't kind of step back and not have to be down there every day. But I had to be on top of him every day and then meeting with him every day on the phone or whatever. Yeah. And then I'd come down at weekly at least and just when really, really hands on, a lot of sweat equity on the first when you find, when you find and guys, this is a message to all of you. When you find a good contractor, number one, they're if they if you feel like they're charging you more, they're probably worth the more money. This is not every case, but like I've been through a few contractors. I have this one contractor that we're using. Phenomenal. In all honesty, he could just DC the, all the projects, right? Mm -hmm. Like he, he manages the sites. I manage with him, right? And, but when you find good work, you keep it. Like you, don't, you, you pay them well because it's going to only help the vision grow farther, right? Seth, one of the ways that I'm finding contractors, along with Craigslist, Facebook, you know, colleagues and all that, I'm going to, uh, so I live in New Jersey. So if you, you know, People who are professionally licensed, they have to register their uh, company with the, let's just say, New Jersey contractors uh, license, right? Mm -hmm. They have to be, I have to be able to search that license. So I just sub, I just uh, filter for, let's say if I'm looking for building, I look for building and I get a list of all the licensed contractors and then I just call them. Same thing with plumbing, right? Subspecialty. If I'm, I know my units are going to need plumbing work, I go through that because they're all licensed people and you can see how long they've been in business. Cause you can see the longevity of their license. Yeah. So I, if they've been in business for a long time, then there's a reason why they have been, if they've been doing crappy work or stealing money, like the chances are, they're not going to stay in business. Mm -hmm. So I look for seasoned uh, contractors. So that's another good way. Um, I don't know if you're applying it or not, but that's one, one of the ways that I've been starting to recently look for contractors as well. Yeah. So I have not done that. What we ended up doing now is we basically vertically integrated. So we have management and construction in house and that's how we vetted them. We found it was just much easier to hire them full time and then have them, you know, there every day. And yeah, we, they're at our team meetings. They know what we, you know, what we were expecting and what were the vision is. And, and it just has been much better, but if you're not big enough to do that, then yeah, I think that's a great op option. Yeah. Right, right now. Right. Yeah. I'm, I'm not, I'm not at hundreds and hundreds of doors to go vertically integrated to, you know, get to that. But the same, the vision is the same. At some point, this is all going to have to start coming. Like we're going to have to have on staff licensed plumbers and contractors and so on and so forth to manage these multiple projects. Like we're just heading down to Florida this uh, coming week for a project. We're buying 14 units, right? All got to be renovated. I, I live in New Jersey. Right. So I got to, you know, I don't, that's an excuse for me to keep flying down to Florida. So I'm, right. I'm happy for it. Um, but no, it's a, it's a great point that you bring up. So, you know, you know, I kind of want to go look at the fundamental facts, right? You went through the educational process, how you gave, you leverage your time, your experience, right? In the, using your firefighting volunteer work, the things that you've learned, leverage your time with an investor who didn't have time partnered right did that for several years now you're vertically integrated um if you don't mind me asking what does the business look like now like you know how many doors how many staff members or employees and the fact that i can even say this and you still have your regular job and you're not fully into like 100 percent segued in it's it's quite astonishing yeah well i mean like i said i i I'm uh, we, we do 24 hour shifts. And then, I mean, I, every day I'm working on it, you know, and even the weekends and there's even the evenings or whatever. And, and uh, I got a great, my wife is super supportive of it, but, yep. but the uh, yeah, so we've got, so we, we have about 600, a little over 600 units here in central Ohio. 
And then um, there's three of us in the, the stream group, which is kind of like the name of the company. And we've got, uh, we're like vested equity chunks in over 2000 units nationwide. So we've come okay. in and kind of what we did was, you know, we bought, we've bought a lot of stuff here. Uh, and then we, we own and operate. So we have a management company that works directly for us that, that we have about 15 employees between construction and management that uh, we own and operate those 600 plus doors. Uh, and then we've come in with uh, other guys that are, that are buying apartment buildings and maybe they couldn't get the debt done. So we've come in and been those, those um, KPs for them, or maybe they couldn't get, you know, they don't have the experience in the banks. Like, Hey, you know, you gotta, you gotta have somebody else on the team that has the experience and, and, knows what they're doing. So we've come in and, and gotten a chunk of equity, you know, that way or whatnot. So it's, it's opened us up to all kinds of different opportunities by, you know, just again, doing what we're, what we're already doing here. Um, and we chose to kind of go really, you know, again, you're in New Jersey, so you're kind of forced to move or to buy in other markets and we have not had to do that. So we've gone mm. kind of like deep in our own market. Okay. And expanded as like the, uh, the opportunity made sense. Uh, but the, yeah, right now, I mean, we're we like I said, we probably got about fifteen people that work for us, um, and then we are actually we just this year um, we bought or in the process of buying one hundred and fifty acres to do our first big uh, land development. So we'll wow. You know, how we'll how do many do units that. you do on the land development? So it's going to be two hundred apartments, uh, about two hundred um, assisted living, uh, and then yeah, then three hundred single yeah. family. Farms. So we're we're doing all wow. the uh, entitlement stuff right now. So we're building all the streets. They street lights, the underground utilities, like everything, you know, we're doing everything with engineering to kind of create the whole environment, like the subdivision. And then yeah. our goal would be to sell off the single family home chunk to a developer that does, that builds out single, single family. family. We don't, yeah, we don't do it. So, you know, the, the option will be that we stay in as equity partners uh, in that, uh, or we'll completely exit it for the right amount of money. And we'll turn the, the single family subdivision over to them. And then we are going to keep the apartments. That's that's the main goal, right? Because we're multifamily guys. And then the assisted living, you know, there we've we've talked to a couple of different groups that want to be involved in it. Either we'll sell it off completely and cash out, or we'll stay in as some kind of equity partner. And then they'll build it and run it, or okay. we'll build it and then they'll run it like triple net lease. Wow. So, so now how does the financial structure layout right now this is this is you know most of us are probably used to asking private lenders or hard money lenders or institutional banks hey there's this physical asset already built x amount of doors we need this much money will you lend right mm -hmm. you are dealing with dirt pretty much yeah so how are you are you is it all your company's finances going in are you raising capital how does the capital move because i'm sure it's stage based as things progress, you know, once you get site plans done, once you get approval, is different capital raises or is it a series raise? Yeah. So right now we're putting in our own money uh, to pay for all the upfront stuff. So the all the EMD money, the feasibility study, all those different things, you know, that, that kind of come at this stage. And then once we go to close on the land, we'll have to decide, do we want to finance the land and then do like a construction to perm loan? Or do we want to just pay for the land outright, pay cash for it? And then we can do a construction loan afterwards that will pay then for, you know, we're, we're, fat, we're figuring in $6 million or so for the fee, the, the entitlements, it, it, you know, so they'll, they'll fund that. And then as we sell off like the single family, the money we make from that, we can roll into one of the other projects or, you know, whatnot, but the, yeah. So right now we're going to do most of our stuff that we do are 506 B syndications uh, that, you know, the first two deals I did were basically JVs. And then, yep. you know, as I started running out of my own money, and I want to continue to grow faster. I'm like, it only makes sense for us to do it this way. So we've done, been successful with the 506 Bs. I want to uh, say something, Seth, because a yeah, lot of, this is a psychological breakthrough. Okay. And I know I, a lot of people that are going to see this, it just went over their head. See how casually you said, I ran out of my own money. If you were to tell that to someone working a nine to five with no entrepreneur business acumen, right? Like not even wanting to look into that avenue they would have a pit in their throat, right? Like they would feel choked up, like ran out of money. How is he going to survive? How's he going to make it? But that's the beauty of what we do. That's real estate, right? Like it, when you run out of your own money for the right reasons, you know, not gambling it away. Don't get me wrong. Right. Running out of money for the right reasons. You're investing your money into deals, right? That's a good thing to say. 
Yeah. I've got so much cash deployed of my own into deals that my equity, my, my uh, net worth, a- asset worth is quite large, right? I just wanted to highlight that because a lot of people are not going to catch that. They're like, where money? Well, how's it keep going? No, it's a different running out of money. The right. running out yeah, of money all, yeah, is you're exactly right. Yeah, it's all tied up in in the assets, and so you know, yeah, we can yep. refi or sell, and we'll get it all back plus more. But um, and so that's really it. So that it pushed me to you know to really start to look into syndications and whatnot. So we've done uh, we've been successful with five hundred six Bs, uh, which is basically like friends and family. Pre-existing relationships is what mm-hmm. you know you have to have. You know we've been able to fund everything with below the threshold of having to go into uh, just accredited investors only. Um, yeah. And then this this you know it's all kind of segued into this development deal, right? Because this deal we're going to do it as a fund and we're going to raise the money. But you know everybody that we that is going to put into this deal, one the deal's got to be good, right? It has mm-hmm. to be it's got to make sense. But then two they can look at our you know the past. Uh, what we've done in the past, our past deals and our current deals. And we always give preference to those who have already invested with us if they want to reinvest yep. uh, into a deal like this. And then if, if we still don't have enough, then like I said, the, then we just start making calls and, and doing, and you know, like I said, you're constantly networking as part of what I do now is mm-hmm. my time is better spent instead of going there and being the guy doing drywall or running material or, you know, doing whatever, answering, you know, you know, certain emails or anything that like basically doesn't, um, push us to making more money or making new connections with people that want to get involved with what we're doing or, or learning about what we're doing. You know, it, it just, it's, it's kind of, it's not advantageous for me to do those things anymore. So yeah. that's all I focus on now. So what, as, as, okay. So now that you're in this development phase with this project, I'm sure there's probably other projects going on, you know, going back to the fact that you, you traded your time, right. To partner up with somebody. What is some things that maybe, you know, you could uh, use some help on where somebody listening to this say, hey, I could I can lend my time to Seth in the opportunity to potentially learn from him. I mean, clearly, you know, you, you're, you've accomplished a lot and obviously you're going to continue to accomplish a lot. Um, but I, I think it would be very helpful um, that we can help you as you uh, have taken the time to share with us. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 always interesting because I've probably talked to, I know a lot of guys at wholesale or they have, you know, they do a great, they have a phenomenal wholesaling business or or whatnot. And I've always told them like, you know, if you if you have the systems and processes in place to be a great wholesaler, it really wouldn't take a whole lot to take one person on your team and point them in, the, you know, and have them look at multifamily. And yep. and I've, I've given the pitch to multiple people that never, you know, there's a lot of, like, I mean, one thing I've realized and, and it's no, no negative fault to anybody, right? But there, everybody likes to talk. And, you know, like the days of me, like going out and grabbing coffee with people or having lunch or whatever, like, I just can't do it anymore. Right. Yeah. Because, and if I do even kind of like a buffer before that is I will give, I'll have a call and then I'm like, okay, I'll give you these three things to do these action steps. And that right there will weed people out. Or, you know, th- there's a reason why people that put masterminds together or put your groups together where they, they, you know, they can, they can really like accelerate your growth. They mm-hmm. charge money because it's a buffer, right? If you're, if you're paying a thousand a month or, or 10,000 a year or 50,000 a year or whatever, the bigger, the buffer, the, the, and you pay that or whatever it is the, the, you know, that the other people that are in that room with you have also paid that or are doing that. And so yep. it, weeds, it weeds out a lot of people. And so for me, you know, I've, I've asked this is like something that I've told a ton of guys that have just never taken me up on it. But if anybody that's got, you know, good wholesaling experience or have those systems in place, we're always looking to work with people that can um, track down sellers. I just don't have the time to do it. We don't have anybody right now. That's yep. on staff, but we're like, you know, a lot of our stuff comes from brokers. A lot of our stuff comes from off market stuff that, you know, mm-hmm. relationships I have with those guys, but you know, I could say, Hey, look in these four markets in central Ohio, you call everybody that owns something in those markets above this unit. Like I can, you know, we just put a mass 25,000 uh, person email list out to people that own apartments that we've, you know, we work with a company to, to kind of fine, fine tune that list and said, here's our buying criteria. If you own any of these buildings and you're looking to sell, call me. Yeah. And, but that's, that's something that, like I said, if you, if you have the systems and you have the time, but you've never taken down a big deal, here you go. We'll give Turn you a deal. We'll pay you. We'll do whatever. Yeah. And all guys, I, we, gods. we guys in this podcast, we just found you a buyer. And here's what people don't realize. If you, if you start to 
if you start a real estate business, it's wholesaling. If you find all the end pieces, then you can design your business facilitating those end people, right? You're one person, Seth, right? You just gave your criteria. You gave what you're willing to do. Somebody can literally listen to this and design an entire business for Seth and make money. I'm just going to find Seth deals because I know he'll buy them. I know this is his criteria. I'm finding these deals. I know he's going to buy them. Yeah, so if you, if you re- guys, if you reverse engineer what folks are looking for and create the business around it, you'll have plenty of business and you'll never be out of business. You know, that was a great point that you brought up, man. No, I, and, and the bigger deals too, like I said, you know, it, you, you got to only have to do less. You know, that's the one thing I do like about it is what we do is less transactional, right? I might do two three transactions a year and I'll make more or acquire more units than somebody that has, you know, if you're flipping houses, I mean, you've got to flip you know, a hundred houses in order to make the money that we could make on one deal or exactly whatever, whatever that difference is. And so it's, like I said, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of, and I think flipping houses or that, you know, single family is so much more risky. The numbers we play with are much bigger, yeah. but the risk is, is much less the bigger that you go, because now you're, you're spreading that risk out over more doors. That, uh, and you have in, in our commercial, like, you know, multifamily side, we have forced appreciation. Absolutely. So if the economy tanks, but we're performing, our asset is worth based off what it's performing, not what the next door neighbor sold his house for or the one across the street. You know, yeah. if he sold it for 100, he sold it for 80. Yeah, guess what? You're hit, man. Yep. But if that multifamily unit is making a million dollars a year, the one next to it isn't, doesn't matter because you're just a better operator. And yep. so you have forced appreciation. So you take out the economical to a degree, you take out the economical factors of saying, hey, the market tanks so my project tank is going to tank. No, you're, you're risk de-risked by going into these commercial spaces. Um, so now as we move to that last E, right, enrichment, how has real estate and doing what you're doing enriched your personal life? Oh, I mean, you know, it, it, we've worked a ton in order to get to where we're at now. Like I said, you know, it's, endless hours it feels like however you know we're at a point where we're starting to, to, to recognize some of the rewards for that you know the yeah. the cash flow from the properties that i own the majority of is you know is phenomenal i mean just the, the just the money from the laundry room is more than most people probably make in a month you know and and, and so, don't tell me that man it hurt my feelings yeah. well not if you're doing again <laughs> if you're doing real estate in the houses you're doing pretty good but you know again the the average w2 worker you know, maybe this is one thing that, that people don't realize either is if you've worked your W2 job for any length of time and you have like a self-directed IRA or a 401k, you can tap into those funds, especially if you transfer to a self-directed IRA and invest in deals that we're doing or yeah. that somebody else is doing. And you can unlock a lot of cash flow that you never, uh, you know, never thought possible. And you're in your still, still maintaining your job. So there's, there's one, there's all. Seth, the is there a minimum that you for non-credit, is there a minimum requirement that you ask for or, or have put out saying, hey, this is the minimum that we you need to have to get into one of these deals? 1,000, 2,000, 5, 10, whatever it is for non-accredited. Yeah. So it just depends on the size of the deal. We're raising okay. like $3 million. You know, usually 50 to 100,000 is the minimum. Okay. If it's something smaller, like we just did a deal, 24 units, smaller than what we normally do, but uh, we, you know, we gave it, it was an opportunity for us to bring in three guys and kind of mentor them. They wanted to kind of get like a cockpit view of what this whole thing looks like. So we were like, rather than you pay to be a part of a mastermind and, and get a certificate at the end that is, I wouldn't say it's not a, a worth anything, but they were coming to us. And, and so for me, I was if like, I had, if I had a, a sound board or something like dropping money or golden nugget guys, that did you listen, man, I, I got to highlight these. Did you just catch what he said? He said that it, instead of just simply investing in mastermind, right? The ROI is knowledge. Sure. But what Seth just said is if you deployed funds into one of his projects, A, you're going to get a return on that money financially. Yep. But B, he's going to guide you and show you the process as well. So you get two for the price of one. So that's that's. That's crazy yeah. stuff, man. Yeah, so we did this deal with these guys, and uh, it was three three guys that wanted to kind of get into what we're doing. So we said, "Yeah, put the money. If you guys put the money in, we'll put in the rest." We bought the deal. They got a little bit of equity. They get their return. They get their prep, 
and then they, we, we do zoom calls. We do, you know, we, we basically show them what's behind the curtain yeah. and then they can either go off and do their own thing. They're building their resume. They're doing their thing. But like I said, it helped us get the deal done. And it was our first like um, kind of way that we thought like, Hey, we want to try to give back and, and help some, of, um, some other people out and then really see like, you know, are we able to provide the value that we think we can? And so, you know, these guys, you know, it's, it's a, it's a Q and a session with us every week yeah. that we can have. And, I, th- I think it's been going great so far. I think that they would agree. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, that's the other side of the coin, man. Like, you know, you, you've you seen the, the, the fruits from the labor that you've put in. And now you've not only positioned your business in a manner that, hey, it can continue to keep growing. But you've, you're doing it in such a way that it benefits other people that just may, A, may not have the time or the knowledge, but still position them to change their life as well. Because, hey, $200 extra a month is more than zero, right? Yeah. And so, man, that's a great, great piece that you've put together. Um, I'm, I'm, I, listen, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to definitely copy cut that thing. That is <laughs> phenomenal stuff right there, man. That, that I mean, that's a game changer right there. You're, you're leveraging two fronts by executing one activity. Good stuff, man. Yep, yep. So what's what's the what's the goal for this year? I don't like those massive like five year goal, the two year five year goal, man. No. Yeah. What do you like? You know, what is something that's on your heart that you want to accomplish? You know, business, personal, whatever it may be. Yeah, I think the big thing that we're going to focus on this year is the development. But uh, you know, so that's going to take up a lot of you know. Again, you're not necessarily doing. We don't have to do 25 deals in a year for it to be impactful, right? It's going to be a a massive deal that's going to be amazing for us and get us into that development space. Uh, and it's not like we're just developing like three houses. I mean, we're, this is a huge project. So that's super exciting. Uh, but the other thing that is, you know, we're doing a lot more with social media and content creation and trying to get the word out there. And it, it's not, it, 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 it's not because like, I think that like I have the greatest solution to everybody's problems, but mm-hmm. it's just, you know, I was, I always kind of re- refer back to the matrix when, you know, Neil gets asked to take, you know, which pill are you going to take? Right. Okay. Once you take that, that, red pill and you're exposed to how life-changing this can be i can't help but tell other people about it and like yeah. I help but like want to help other people uh change their lives and and whatever that means right i mean there's guys i know that do big syndications and and they do great at it but there's also people that i know that own 100 of their own deals and they do smaller deals right that 14 unit that you talked about mm-hmm. if you buy that on your own right maybe you you call me and you're like hey i i want to get into this here's what i've got here's what i do you know we help you get the deal done that yeah. deal right there alone will cash flow more for you and change your life in one deal yeah. than getting into a big syndication. Like it, it, it's really just depends on like what people's goals are. That's why I was asking, what are your goals? 100%. What do you want to do? What do you want to get done? And then how can we help people facilitate that? And, and once you get the first one done or you get that resume built or you get, it's so much easier. Uh, yeah. It's a snowball effect, man. And it's just yeah. the momentum just keeps going That's as right. long as you keep allowing that snowball to roll down the hill. Yeah. And I will add that I think that we kind of talked about masterminds and whatnot, but you know, it's, I, I will say that if I could go back and tell my former self, you know, something or give myself an advice, it would have been to get with somebody uh, that would, that could help guide you that yeah. maybe it doesn't necessarily mean you have to, you have to join a $20,000 mastermind, but if you can find somebody in your market or, you know, you hear this and you're like, Hey, this, this, you know, that guy doesn't sound so crazy, meaning me, you know, <laughs> Let's chat. And then, like I said, see how we can help or, or somebody like me, because that's really the thing is if you can link up with somebody that can help you avoid some of the minefields you might walk into doing it alone, it might save you a ton of money. Yes. A ton of time. It will help you get to the front of the line faster. And those are all important things, right? Because hundred percent, man, you know, hundred percent, bro. Listen, I said, uh, how can people, you know, you talked about social media branding. How can people get a hold of you? What's your, and I'm, I'm going to, Post all your details, you know, your you, handles for your social media profile. But what are you on? You on TikTok? You on Instagram, yeah, Facebook, yeah, LinkedIn? So, uh, what are you on? Yeah, Facebook, we're on just Seth Teagle. Uh, Instagram, I think it's Seth.Teagle or Seth Peary Teagle is how you can find me on there. Uh, we're putting some stuff out on TikTok now. It should just be under my name. Okay. Uh, LinkedIn. Uh, and then we have our website, which is www.thestreamgroups.com. And you can fill out the questionnaire on there and then it comes right to me. Um, or to Ryan, who works with us, and one of us will get a hold of you, and, and okay. like I said, kind of see how we can connect and help each other grow, and, and what you want to get into. Um, awesome. Those are, yeah, like I said, those are the 
the easiest ways to do it. Awesome, man. I, I, listen, Seth, I appreciate appreciate your time so much, man. We love the journey that you took us through, right? Those, those several years of gaining that education, leveraging your time to, to get yourself ahead, right? Not, not afraid to put the sweat equity in, um, becoming empowered to start taking those decisions, start taking those chances, right? Those good risks to get yourself to where you are now. And, and man, with this big project that you have going on, Man, we'd love to see um, as you're recording this and you're going through it. I know we'd love to see how the project is coming along and the stages that you're going through. And uh, really, really love the fact that, you know, you've turned that other side of the coin over and, and now have positioned yourself where, hey, we're here to help you too, man. Seth, I appreciate your time so much. Thank you so much for being on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, brother. We'll stay in touch. Thank you. Take care. We did a good exercise. Myself, my business partner stepped away from the business for two days. You couldn't reach me. You couldn't email me. And I wanted to find out where the kinks in the business are, right? Our team is good enough and we have the right people on that are, they're able to do their role and they're able to do it really well.